I we'll just want to start the service with a couple of prayers, and they're from Scripture. The first one is really, um, well, it, it's not really, it is the Shema. The Shema is um, the declaration of faith in Judaism, um, asserting that there is but one God. And if you're a devout Jew, you would say this every day. Um, so we're going to start with that, and then I'm moving on to a few verses from Psalm 86, which links in with that as our opening prayer. With the Shema, I'm going to replace the word Israel. It starts off with, hear, O Israel. I'm going to replace it with, hear, O church. Hear, O church, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. For he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Lord, we worship you. You are the one true God, the God, the God above all gods, for there is no other God besides you. And so our response to you, Lord, is to offer you the love of our hearts and our worship. Help us, Lord, to love you more. Help us to worship you both this morning and in our whole lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So you'll find, I hope, some links with that as we go through the service. Um, the service is, is pretty much follows the theme today. Uh, it doesn't always do that. Sometimes we just leave it to the preacher. But today uh, we're following the theme. And our first song picks up some of the thoughts from that opening prayer. Um, it's How Great Thou Art, a lovely old hymn. Um, and we're going to listen to that if we're in the building. But if you're at home, obviously you can sing it. So um, it's going to be on icing, so you don't need to go off to YouTube. Thank you, Matt. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, I see the stars, I hear
God his son not sparing Sent him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art! How great thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great. We're going to read Psalm 78 uh, now, or the, the start of Psalm 78, in a reflective um, way. And I just want to put that in the context of the service. The theme, as I say, is generation to generation, passing on the baton. Um, and this psalm speaks of the wonderful truths um, that for centuries were hidden of God. They were gradually revealed throughout God's dealing with Israel. And it talks about what God has done for us and for them, for his people, um, over the years and over the generations. And one of our roles is to preserve those truths, to pass those truths on to future generations so that these things endure, so that faith and truth of God is not lost from the earth. So we're going to read this psalm twice with a pause in between, and then afterwards we're going to give anybody a chance, uh, if you have something to share, if it prompts some thoughts in you. Um, if you're in the building, you can come up here and use the microphone. Please do that because otherwise those on Zoom can't hear you. Just a warning if you come this way, there's a trip hazard. If you come this way, there isn't. Um, uh, if you're on Zoom, you'll be, um, you'll be given the ability to unmute. Um, so I'm not going to repeat those instructions afterwards. That's, that's how to do it. So you can share whether you're in the building or on Zoom. So we're going to read this from two translations. Uh, firstly, the New International Version and then the New Living Translation. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants we will tell the next generation. We will tell them the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so that the next generation would know them even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God 
and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. O oh my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children, we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. So as we reflect on that together, please do be brave and um, share if something comes to your mind. Hello, it's uh, Paul here. I don't know if everyone can hear me, but uh, I was very challenged by verse 4 in that psalm. In the translation that certainly Joy read, it said, we will not hide the knowledge of God from our children. And I thought, why would we ever hide it? And yet I think... Sometimes, because of all the other things our children are exposed to uh, at school and in the media, um, we feel perhaps reticent to contradict and to speak out what we know is true. And my prayer is that we will not hesitate, uh, even though it may not be the in thing, and we may seem old fashioned. It is the truth, and we should share it. It reminded me, uh, that reading reminded me of um, a few years ago, I um, shared a message in a at a wedding, and I used as uh, a text, um, do not forget the former things, the things you learnt long ago. And a couple of weeks later, we went to another wedding and the pastor there preached and shared uh, on the text, open your eyes, I'm doing new things. And I thought, well, that's a bit contradictory to what I said. But those two texts are, in fact, just a couple of pages apart in the book of Isaiah. Uh, they're both written there. Uh, first of all comes, open your eyes, I'm doing new things. But then Isaiah shares that God says, don't forget the things you learnt long ago. Don't forget the former things, because they're so important. Yes, God does new things. Yes, we must look out for new things God is doing, for new instructions he gives us, for new leading, for new experiences he wants to share with us. But don't forget the things you learnt long ago. I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, he says. Thank you, Barry. We still have time for others to share. In the least hazardous way. <laughs> this is being brave because I'm not quite sure what's going to come out. But um, um, the verse that really struck me on both occasions was, I'll teach you hidden things, so along the lines of Paul and what you're going to be sharing. 
And immediately I thought of the veil that was split in two from top to bottom, actually, which was sort of awkward when it was such a thick curtain. And I remember hearing that instead of being, we would have thought that a curtain would be ripped from the bottom to the top like that, but actually to be hit, split from the top to the bottom is much more difficult. And how wonderful it is that we now have the, cur the veil to God's, you know, to God's truths completely divided, split, so that we can hear his truth. So we need to, to be sort of willing to go to him, spend time with him, listen to his truths, so that we can share them with others to our generation now and to the future generation, which I know you're going to share on. So that's what came to me very clearly was the, the curtain. So um, I just thank the Lord that we have this ability now. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We've probably got time for one more, whether it be on Zoom or in the building. Okay, we're going to uh, thank you for those who shared. Um, we're now going to come to our intercessory prayers. We pray, Lord, for um, the first time that the community kids are meeting today um, since the lockdown ease. We pray that they would uh, have a good time together and they would learn something of you. We pray, Lord, for our church. We pray for the outreach. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and through us to those around. And we pray, Lord, for the royal family in their loss at this time. We pray that you would be a comfort to them too. So, Lord, please be with us in this service and speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now Rachel's going to come and uh, share a word. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, this is, this is not the sermon, so... Um, I'm going to be getting up again. <laughs> so I have been um, encouraged by the leadership to share this word. Um, so I'm just going to kind of read it out. About 10 days ago, I was doing um, my reflections at home. Jonathan, could you just move that camera down? Because I look like I'm a, I'm, I know I'm small, but I look like a real midget on for Zoomers. Um, <laughs> so yeah, about 10 days ago, I, I sat down in my the place that I, I do my quiet time and I thought I need to spend more time with God be, be more serious so I'm going to spend a lot of time today and just ask God to reveal to me anything that he would like to reveal to me about the church about our outreach about what's going on at the moment and I felt that he did reveal something so I emailed Jonathan after that and said I think God might have given me something but I'm just going to put it out there so I'll read the email I wrote to Jonathan and then what um, someone else, another picture someone else had after that. So um, on the 30th of March, I wrote to Jonathan, I feel I had something significant in my quiet time this morning. It didn't have to do specifically with the readings, but I think God revealed it to me. So I'm sharing it with you. I was dwelling on things happening in the church and I asked God to speak to me about it. He brought to my mind, see, I'm doing a new thing. Just what Barry said, actually. Now it springs up, don't you perceive it? He gave me this verse some months ago and I had already shared it with you. And then he gave it to someone else in the congregation, if you remember, and that person, she had shared it with you. So this was my email to Jonathan. So I was reminding him <laughs> that verse has come up a lot. And I was also reminded of a vision that Paul Green had given us a year ago, which said there was a striking picture of flowers springing up, blooming, dropping hundreds of seeds everywhere and everything was multiplying. And I said, I'd always interpreted those pictures and words to mean something about our outreach, fruit from the seeds of outreach, which it might be. But this morning, God gave me a clear picture of this happening within our own church community. Very specifically, I was looking out at the congregation in this picture and people were standing up and being illuminated and spotlighted. And God said, can't you see I'm doing a new thing? I'm raising up a community that's passionate for Jesus, for me. So I had a sense that the new thing, the seeds, the fruit is actually springing out from within us. We'd kind of always been focusing out. Not that that's bad, because that will happen as well. But I thought, yes. And God's saying we, there's a real keenness from within our own community to get involved and to raise people up. And our role needs to be nurturing, of releasing, 
of raising up encouraging, not binding or stifling. And we need to understand that God is ahead of us doing his work and we shouldn't in any way try and block it. So I said, that's pretty exciting, but scary. So I ended up praying that God would clearly guide us and that we would follow his lead. I said, that's it, something for you to meditate on. Okay, that was my email. Then Jonathan responded to me a bit later that day saying, oh, it seems like that could be a word from God. It resonates, you know, maybe it is. Fine, just left it like that. Then on Wednesday, the next day, <clears throat> I received an email from Jonathan. He'd just received a call from Olive out of the blue. And Olive shared with Jonathan said, she said, I had a picture, something came to me yesterday. I didn't really know what it is, but today I've become aware of what it is. So I want to share it with you. So she had that same, almost similar, um, it, was, it was the same day that I had had that picture. Olive said, this is from the email she sent to Jonathan. Well, sorry, Jonathan wrote to me. Olive was praying for the leadership. God gave her a picture. The leadership was stronger because everyone else was now involved. It was a happy picture. The leaders were in a circle. Our hands were outstretched, holding hands. And everyone who had gifts and talents or roles in the church joined in. They came and joined us and mingled. They stood with us. We were sporting each other, holding up our arms. They were happy, enjoying it. They were happy doing what they were doing. They were helping and they were leading, but they didn't themselves necessarily want to be elders. That's what Olive said. They were just happy to be involved. So we just felt this was very confirming of the word that I'd had. So I'm sharing both of these things today just because it's for discernment for us. It's an encouragement. In that sense, it's prophetic in terms of it's a word of encouragement for us as a church. And um, we should notice see how I'm doing a new thing, see how it springs up. Do we not perceive it? So maybe we just need to think about what God's doing amongst us as well as what he is going to do um, later on. Rachel, I'm not small. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. I would commend that word to you to reflect upon and to consider. Um, I think it's exciting. God has been speaking through lots of people. It's not just about the leadership. And as you see, there was an example there. And, it, and it's not only through, not just not through the leadership, it's not just for the leadership. That was a picture of the whole church um, being blessed. Thank you, Rachel. We're going to um, listen to our next song. Now, this one is on YouTube and it follows the theme of the service. Um, this is uh, the, the Apostles' Creed set to song um, by Hillsong. Um, that is an, uh, we've read the Shema, which was a way of encapsulating and saying the truth about God, um, part of it. And the Apostles' Creed is another way of doing that. And we're going to listen to that song uh, now on YouTube. So uh, those of you who are on Zoom need to go off uh, to that now. Thank you. Thank you. So we're coming to a time of communion now. Um, Jesus established a reminder. We've thought about reminders. Jesus established a reminder of his own sacrifice through this bread and wine, a, rem a reminder of the new covenant that he initiated through his death. I'm going to read a portion of the gospel and just partly to stretch our legs and we'll copy the Anglicans, I think, and we'll stand as we read this gospel section, if you're comfortable to stand, um, and then we'll sit down before we take the bread and wine. So let's stand. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So let's take our seats and let's do what Jesus commanded and let's eat bread 
in remembrance of him and of his body broken for us as the bread has been broken for us. And he took the cup, which represents his blood shed for us for cleansing. We are forgiven and cleansed. So let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we remember you. We remember your incarnation, your life, your death and your resurrection. That was all for us. And we give you thanks. And we worship you. Thank you for this reminder. And Lord, we pray now for Rachel as she comes to speak to us. We pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to her and through her to us. May we hear what you are saying to us this morning. Hear, O oh church, for the Lord wants to speak to us. Amen. Okay, great, thank you. Um, just took me my head off now. Great, so today is the last in our series on God, God's big picture. If you remember, we started off looking at creation. We looked at kind of an aerial view, what God might look down on and look out to the universe. We talked about the full kind of Bible story, the long view. And then Roger talked about the corporate side of salvation, individual and corporate. Paul spoke about mission, and then Jonathan spoke about an eternal perspective. And today we're going to be talking about our role in the transmission of faith from generation to generation. Our central part in the salvation narrative and our responsibility for remembering God's great work, committing his word and his works, to, and his truth to our memory, and then being faithful in passing it on to retell the next generation. <clears throat> so I'm going to anchor the message today in Paul's, the Apostle Paul's encouragement to Timothy. Um, Paul was kind of facing imminent death. He was going to be martyred. And he wrote to Timothy a word of encouragement and sort of saying, Timothy, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you, 2 Timothy 1.14. Then he says also later, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care so that you will be strong in the grace that is in Christ, in the, of the grace that's in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust those things to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others and pass it on, okay? So Paul's big concern is not necessarily he's going to die, he's going to come and rescue me. He's like, please, please, please pass on that truth that I gave you, I taught you about, I mentored you in. Don't forget to pass it on. Succession and stability. Our duty is to run that race, press on to the goal, preserve the faith. Okay, so I'm going to come at this from two angles today. I've got a special baton, relay baton, for the purpose of this. In fact, I got a bunch of them because I could only buy six, I couldn't buy one. So if anyone wants a load of relay batons after this, and in case you think I bought it to match the outfit, I do actually have a look at it. Okay, so I'll use another. So I don't know about you guys, who, I don't know if anyone likes relay races. I imagine that everybody at some point in their primary school life had to run a relay race. I hated them, but for some reason I was always chosen to be in them. And um, I went to a boarding school in India and we would have something called inter-school sports every year. Paul will remember this because he was at the same school I went to. And 
for some reason, I was okay at running, I was okay at sports, I wasn't fantastic, but I was always in the school sports team. So I would be running the 200s or the hurdles or javelin. And then annoyingly, I would also have a place in the relay. And the relay was always at the end of the sports day, wasn't it? It was like a whole, everyone's there cheering you on, everyone's looking at you, you've got your team members. And I was never the fastest, so I was never the first sprinter or the last one, because that fourth one has to go really fast. So I was always the second or the third. And I hated it because I thought there's so much pressure on me to perform. Not only have I got to pick up a baton, you know, carefully without dropping it, I've actually got to pass it on as well, which is another potential problem in the race because you might drop it. Or that person, you know, you're running up to them and they start running too fast. And you're like, no, you started too quick. I can't catch. And it was just a lot of responsibility. And I thought, I don't mind if I fail in my individual races. Fair enough. But in the relay, it's just a nightmare. And I just didn't like it at all. But, you know, I had to do it. And I think probably some of us have those same emotions about relays. And the interesting thing, if you think about a relay, it's not necessarily the runners, it's the baton that's so important. And it's very much a metaphor that I want to think about this morning when we think about passing on God's word, God's truth from one generation to another, right? That's the important thing. And that's what Paul was saying to Timothy. It's really important. You pass it on. You pick it up and you pass it on. So we're going to have two sort of parts to this sermon. The first one is, in fact, Matt, you could show a couple of pictures. So the first part of this is about our part in picking up the baton. I mean, you must know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you, we are all very much part of the same salvation story that Jesus was central to. It's kind of a living chain. You know, we are connected intimately to those heroes and heroines of old to Moses, to Joshua, to Rahab, David, Elijah, Mary, Joseph, Lydia, Paul, all those, all those guys. But more recently too, Wycliffe, Wilberforce, Wesley, Julian of Norwich. More recently, my grandparents, great Christians. My parents, great Christians. You know, we are intricately connected through our Christian lives to the past and what has gone before, the generations that have gone before. And what a privilege that is. Surely we count it as a privilege. They all played their parts. They played faithfully. They were obedient. Abraham was obedient. Moses obeyed. King David obeyed. The disciples obeyed. Jesus, the apostles. So from generation to generation, faithful Christians have submitted to the will of God and been part of his salvation plan. Some have even faced torture, death, ridicule, suffering, others not. And it's all for the sake of passing on the truth, right? God's truth, God's word. Very much guard the deposit that was entrusted to you, to them, so that you can entrust it to reliable people. So we really have to take seriously the fact that we are not living in a vacuum, in a little 70 plus 80 plus year slot we are intimately connected and we benefit from we ride on the benefit of that as what's gone before and it's really critical that we understand our role in being custodians protectors preservers guardians of the faith you know we're tasked to be storytellers we're tasked to be teachers we're tasked to preserve the truth. And how can we do that unless we really know what the stories of the past are? You know, unless we know the narrative of salvation, unless we know what the Bible stories are, what Jesus did, unless we're willing to be taught ourselves. So when I was um, preparing this sermon, I was drawn to Joshua 4. And in Joshua 4, God makes it starkly apparent that we must preserve the stories of his truth and goodness from the past. We've talked about it already a bit this morning. So in Joshua 4, the Israelites, they've been in the wilderness for 40 years. A faithless generation has come and gone since they left Egypt. A new generation being led by Joshua 
is crossing the Jordan, right? They're crossing to the promised land that they've been waiting to get. Everything looks fantastic. They're just about to embark on a new future of prosperity, land flowing in milk and honey. And they're all, you can imagine the excitement in the air, thousands, potentially a million Israelites crossing, going, finally, we can get out of this wilderness. But Joshua, the leader says, wait, okay, wait, everyone just wait a minute before we go on, there's important business for us to do with God. And he asks them to look back and remember what has gone before. And I'm going to read from Joshua 4, verses 1 to 9, and then 19. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests were standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he'd appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what on earth do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So Joshua did what was commanded. Then verse 19, on the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that had been taken from the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he'd done to the Red Sea. He did it so all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so you might always fear the Lord your God. So God is saying, remember, remember what I have done for you. It's so important we have a sense of history in our Christian lineage. So I don't know about you guys, but there, there's a picture up here. You could show it on Zoom as well, Matt, if you can. Um, but I was not, I, I was in the church when this picture came in a vision to somebody, but the verse, you have not been this way before, was very much Joshua leading the Israelites. And this came to the church before I joined this church. It came before this church was in this building. And this church, which Jonathan might talk about a bit more later, I'm just talking secondhand, but I've learned the story as best as I could, was given this that it's move out of the old building you're in, you've got to move to somewhere else. And you haven't been this way before, but I'm gonna trust you. And those 12 stones there symbolize the 12 stones I've just been talking about from the Joshua reading. The history of why this church is where it is today is represented somewhat in this picture. And in the stories, people pass on about where this church has come from and where it might be going. And it's so important, it just is so important for us to understand that when we arrive somewhere, I don't know, about you but there's sometimes in organizations and churches in particular you'll get a new leader come in i can think of my own university organization new leader comes in and they say right we're starting from scratch everything before just doesn't exist it's really important in a christian community to say well wait a minute where have we come from god's already been at work here let's figure out where we're going and try and contribute to that so our job is to preserve the truth that was passed to us and pass it on and will we be the one will you be the one to break that chain to drop the baton if you are if i am then that's pretty much a sin of omission isn't it it's a failure to run it's a failure that would be kind of an offense against those who've taught me it would be a disappointment to those who are training alongside me and it would be a sin that i can't pass it on to the future 
So we need to learn the stories of the past. We need to learn the stories of the Bible. We need to be teachable. We need to get into the word, learn scripture, memorize scripture whenever we can. We need to learn our history of Christ, Christian heritage so that we can pass it on. So the second part of this story is passing on. So we need to pick up the baton, take it seriously, and then we need to pass it on. Timothy says we need to entrust it to reliable people so they can teach others. It's like an intergenerational transfer, transmission of faith. But who are these others? Who are these others? I mean, clearly, there's all kinds, it's pretty obvious. The others are the younger generation, newer believers, children, the next, the future generation. In fact, there was some recent research um, I looked into when I was studying theology a, a year or so ago on Generation Y. Generation Y, for those who know about Generation X, Y, are the millennial generation. They were born between the 80s and the 90s. And they're kind of the first generation people think of as becoming increasingly familiar with technology and with digital electronic stuff. And th this research says that this move to a postmodern culture, this whole sort of consumeristic pick and mix culture, along with the dramatic reduction in church attendance, means that the chain of Christian memory for young people is under very severe strain, it's pretty much lost. And because their connection with faith communities is so, so limited. And the faith community, our community, any faith community embodies a tradition, a lineage, a storytelling. And without that, it's very hard to pass truths and knowledge from one generation to another. So inheriting the tradition and the testimonies and the words is really helpful to validate and appropriate what people believe. It's really helpful to have this here because we can think, what, where have we come from? Where are we going to? How has God blessed us in the past? What words has he given to us? Oh, it validates what we're doing now. God is still speaking. And it's just a real challenge for us because in the context of postmodern UK, regular church attendance is at about 5%, even less. And that means the vast majority of the population, particularly the young generations, are not, the narrative of Christianity is totally alien to them. It's really hard to pass on something without having, like, well, what basis are you going to pass it on? People don't know the stories. So there's a vacuum for us, and it's a real challenge for us in presenting Christianity. But anyway, we're told we're responsible for it. And obviously, the first sort of port of call is our own children, our own youth, our own young people, right? And um, as parents, as grandparents, as teachers, as aunts and uncles, we have a responsibility to pass it on. And the other text that I um, was led to praying for this was Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 is really instructive for us about passing on stories and the narrative of the Bible to the next generation. So in Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 12, I'm going to read some parts of that. Moses is reminding the people of Israel about all the things God's done. And he says, these, Deuteronomy 6, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you were crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commandments that I give you. And so you may enjoy, enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So in the future, when your son says, what's the meaning of all this? These laws and decrees, tell them 
we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders. God is calling us to dedicate our young people, our children to him and raise them in his ways. We need to dedicate ourselves to Christian education. And I don't necessarily mean formal Christian faith-based schools. I'm saying Christian education of ourselves, but also of our children, our grandchildren, whatever youth or younger people we have around us. Because that's a way of validating, preserving the faith and showing them how God has been working in our lives. It's a testimony. He says, impress them on your children, talk about them. When you sit at home, when you're walking along the road, when you lie down, tie them as symbols on your hands. In fact, if you show the, the next slide, the Jews actually took this incredibly literally seriously. So I'm gonna show you some of the things they did according to this, this verse. Um, so in verses eight and nine, yes, tie them symbol, tie the symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. So they would have these things called phylacteries. I don't know if anyone's heard of these, but you would tie with sort of um, string or whatever, ribbon, um, and you'd have these little boxes. And inside the boxes, there would be verses, <laughs> scriptural verses. If you show the next slide, Matt. And if you went to a bar mitzvah today, you might even see very strict Jews observing this and the children have these little boxes on their heads. Um, I'm not suggesting that's what we should do. I'm not suggesting we all go on Amazon when we get home and buy some of these. I don't think Oliver and Asher would be too impressed. Um, I think they'd probably leave the home. But this was symbolic of remembering. So the kids say, what on earth is all this about? You get to tell a story, you get to talk about what God had been doing. And there was another thing they would do, write them down on the door frames of your house. The next slide, they would have these, called, these things called mezuzots. I don't know if you've seen them, so you would buy um, little fancy, I mean, you can go in Israel now and get lots of really fancy ceramic ones. And you inside them, you would put scripture rolled up and you put it on your door frames of your house or even inside your house between the different rooms. And it would just remind you. So you can show the next slide as well if you want that. So I guess what I'm saying is, no, we don't have to do this, obviously. And as I said, I would be disowned if I tried to implement that in my household, although the door frame ones look quite nice, I have to say. But we do have to take our responsibilities seriously as parents, as grandparents, as teachers. And there are many ways we can do this, but we don't do it. We can easily buy some posters with Christian verses on them and put them on our walls. We can easily... There's so many great Christian resources out there. There's fantastic bookshops. In Brighton, we used to have the most amazing Christian bookshop. I'd take the kids in and it was just exciting. They'd buy little coffee mats with verses. They might buy um, you know, posters for their room. There's all kinds of things we can do and we don't do. And in generations before us, they didn't have all these cool resources. We've got amazing resources. You can go and buy really cool books for youth, really good books for children. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be trying and taking our responsibility much more seriously. Teaching our kids about the stories of Easter, of Christmas, of Daniel, of Joseph, of all those heroes we might know. And do we actually know some of the really cool stories of part Christians who might have suffered, done things for Christ, maybe last century? Maybe we should read about them with our kids. Maybe we should start teaching our kids, or we ourselves should learn some Bible verses. I'm not great at this, I have to say. But um, I remember from VBS, there's a, because I was helping in the tents, I remember some verses just because of the annoying jingles that went with it. And the kids remember those verses really well. And about a month ago, I was reading about the gifts of the Spirit. And when I was young, I learned a really annoying song about the gifts of the Spirit. And I thought, right, I'm going to teach Oliver and Asher this. They're going to hate me but it's a way they're gonna learn it. So I started singing it and I made Asha sing it with me. And Oliver's like, there's no way I'm singing that song. But I sang it at least four or five times for about three days. And then the following week I was in the car with Oliver and I said, Oliver, could you know what the fruit of the spirit is? And he said, I'm not singing that song. He said, but I know it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I'm like, good, good. So things like that, or 
trying to talk to young people or your grandkids or your kids, give them some testimonies about what God has done for you. What has God done? What, when has God spoken to you? Like you need to get into the habit of not finding it awkward to share with your own family members what God might be doing in your life. So we were in the Isle of Wight last um, year and we were in a restaurant having a, some breakfast and Ricardo and Oliver had gone off to do some shopping and I was with Asha and I knew I was coming back that weekend and I was going to be leading the Sunday service. And I had a, I wanted someone to give a testimony and I couldn't think, I was praying, I didn't know who. And, I, and Asha knew we were doing this listening to God stuff. And I said, right, Asha, we're waiting for our food. We were sitting in the restaurant. I said, right, we're going to do some listening to God. <laughs> he said, okay. I said, we're going to pray for God to put on our hearts someone who we might like to give a testimony this week. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So we prayed about it. Gave him a minute. I said, oh, and he said, oh, has God given you anyone? I said, no, I haven't. I said, how about you? He said, yeah, I've got someone. I said, who's that? He said, it's David Firth. I said, cool, that's fantastic. So I was like, great. So I, I texted David and he said, yeah, I've actually got something really, I really want to share this week. I was like, that's amazing. So that just those little things help our young people to understand what we believe and they validate it for them. But I'm not great at it, I have to say. This last two weeks, the kids have been going to bed after me and I think I can't be bothered to go and read them anything to do with the Bible. I just wanna to go to bed and watch a series, quite frankly. So I need to tell myself to get better about this. And as well as our children and grandchildren, Timothy, Paul was saying to Timothy, what about mentoring and teaching newer, younger Christians that come among you? Are you gonna take that seriously? You know, all of us potentially have more Bible knowledge than someone else. Maybe not. I might look and go, actually, they clearly are better at this than me. I need to ask them to mentor me. Or maybe I could say that person might be struggling. I'm happy to mentor them. You know, are we ready to get alongside people, encourage them, teach them? Like Lewis and Maribel in Bolivia, right? Lewis has a project called the Timothy Institute. We heard about that a couple of weeks ago. And that's exactly based on this verse, go and teach people, faithful men and women, so that they can teach others, right? It's not a job that you do overnight, you dedicate your life to doing that, and that's what Lewis has done. <clears throat> so how seriously are we taking this responsibility? How seriously are we taking our responsibility to not be lazy, because we have riding on the backs of all these great Christians who've gone before us, we're not under persecution, it doesn't matter, we need to pass it on and we need to know that that's something that God has asked and requires of us. We need to be able to say, I fought that good fight, I ran that race and I finished it and I kept the faith. So I guess two challenges, very small challenges, but obviously require <laughs> commitment. We need to get better at educating ourselves about the Bible, about the stories, about Jesus. Learn a few scriptures, maybe one a week, maybe just print one out, one of your favorite ones that week, just print it out, stick it on your fridge so that it's going into your, your mind. Or maybe you can talk to someone in your house when they say, why have you stuck that up there? You go, well, God's talking to me about this. And then decide to do something very specific to pass on the truth, pass on God's word. Decide to do it and then do it. So think about what it is you can do. Is it children, grandchildren, a younger, newer Christian, a mentee? Maybe it's through your teaching. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, make a positive commitment and do it. You know, you're not, you're not going to get off. You are accountable for passing on this truth. So all of us need to think, what is it we could do a bit better at this week? And um, for me, it's probably going up and reading. Um, we used to go through Bible characters with my kids. I probably just need to get a bit more serious about it. Problem is they just stay up too late now. So need to think about how that fits into my day a bit better. So, yeah, so be encouraged. Pass on the truth, 
even if you haven't done particularly well until now, you can still do it now. There's plenty of younger generation around. There's plenty of people who need to learn. Amen. So we're not having a third song um, today because I wanted to just uh, share something. Well, actually, um, Rachel emailed me last night and said, would you like to just wrap up the service with an explanation of putting in context what's been said with the Joshua story? And I go, would I like to? I would love to, because I think that Joshua passage is very significant. Um, and I want to just say that what Rachel shared earlier about the word that we believe that is prophetic for our church about the flowers springing up in the church is linked with what she's just preached, because it's saying it's not just about the leaders or the ministers or the evangelists doing stuff, it's all of us, and all of us are responsible for passing on the truth. So when nearly, uh, well, just over a year ago, we talked about the spiritual disciplines and outreach that we have to get to know God better so that we can share it, that's the same thing. Um, so when I last preached on... Um, well, even when I last preached, but I preached on the eternal perspective that Rachel mentioned. She'd sent me the sermon from Francis Chan, which I pinched most of for the sermon. And afterwards, she said, I've helped you with your sermon. I expect some input for my next one. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Um, and I didn't think much of it. It was a joke. Um, and then I was going to sleep one night, and I wasn't even thinking about it. But just as I was about to go to sleep, I just felt God say, Tell Rachel, the message has to come from Joshua 4. Sorry, when God speaks, I get tearful and I get excited. It moves me. And I, I, I emailed Rachel the next day and I said, I think God said you need to include Joshua 4 in your sermon. And she said, that's what he told me two weeks ago. And this is characteristic of what is happening at the moment. God spoke a lot through different people last year and he's doing so a lot in the last month. So I just want to put into context the Joshua passage and in particular the 12 stones because I think whenever Joshua is used in this church, it's significant um, for us. So I, I knew, I, I, so I, get, I usually get tearful when God speaks and I get this tightness in my chest and I knew that basing part of the message in Joshua 4 today. I was really excited about today's service. So in 2015, we started growing as a church and we moved to Castle Street. We moved to here in July 2015. In September 2015, um, before we'd moved actually, God had said, had spoken to us through Joshua that you need to move out and move into this building. You need to move out. You need to have faith. And in September 2015, there was a service where the message was based upon Joshua 1. You and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. I'll give you every place where you set your foot. We needed to get ready to enter the land and take possession, to move forward decisively. And then in October 2016, God spoke again very strongly through Joshua chapter 3 and 4, saying that for 40 years, the Israelites had wandered in the desert. And we happen to have been looking, apparently, for a building for about 40 years. <clears throat> I'm not that old. Uh, I'm 40. but <laughs> I hadn't been here for 40 years. And we'd been wandering in the, in the desert, perhaps, for 40 years. And finally, we entered the promised land. And Joshua 3, verse 5 says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things. I wrote all this a few years ago. Um, this isn't something I've made up today. And the promise was that God will do amazing things. And that indeed God was already doing amazing things. Despite all our previous efforts in church, we'd sort of just about held our own. But suddenly we started growing. We almost doubled in a year. Now we were in a new place. And the difference wasn't what we were doing. The difference was that God was on the move. After years when it seemed we'd been banging our head against a brick wall and nothing we did made much difference either way, suddenly we just watched it happen. And then in April 2018, we had a visiting pastor. He wasn't preaching, he was just here as a guest from India, a guy called Jeevan. And in the prayer meeting before the service, God spoke to him and said, tell the church that you are the Joshua generation. 
that we will move in and take possession of the land and people from the town will come into this place. The Joshua story is full of symbols, the 12 stones. They are there to remind us what God has done for us. They are there to remind us to pass it on to future generations. That was exactly the message that God gave us. What symbols would we use to commemorate our journey here? How could we do 12 stones? What does it mean to signify God's provision? We needed to have something to remind us, something to do with the 12 stones in Joshua. And then when we arrived here, um, somebody preached a sermon here on, um, you've not been this way before. Uh, this is a new thing. And again, we've heard that message today. And then um, one of our members had a dream because we couldn't think, how can we picture 12 stones? What do we do? Set 12 stones in the plaster above the door? Somebody had a dream of that picture. And that's why that picture is there. And then they preached on it. That is to remind us of what God has done and is doing for us. And then just a few weeks ago, when we were thinking about how do we, when do we start listening to God, the listening to God outreach? On the day that we were praying and deciding about it, our daily reading was Joshua. At the moment I hear Joshua, my ears prick up. In March, Rachel shared the picture that she had about doing the new thing, the word to her and to somebody else that came to me. And the link, as I say, is that God wants to do a new thing in us, that we are the flowers in the church, that it will be us who pass the baton on, not just a group um, who happen to be the leaders. And that picture of the whole church gathering around and doing it. So the story of entering the promised land has been given prophetically to our church a number of times. And it has always been about stepping out in faith. And we have had it again today. So it is significant. We need to take notice of it. God is moving and God is speaking and we must listen and obey. In two Sundays time, I'm going to be speaking on the various commitments that we made in our covenant service. Do those commitments mean something to us each individually? We made significant commitments. I do really believe that today's message is significant for us. I believe the word that Rachel shared is significant for us. I believe the vision that Olive had was significant for us. Joshua always should make us prick up our ears as a church. It has been given to us since, what was it, 2015? Repeatedly, in a way that, for me, resonates in my heart, and I know it is God speaking. So I want to close the service with a prayer, but it's a prayer based upon some verses from Joshua. And I want us to take these as a challenge and think about it, because in two weeks' time, I'm going to ask you to think about what you're doing about the covenant commitments you made in January. Be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. To love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. And then two more verses. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So may I send you out, or if you're on Zoom, um, to, to end the meeting with the words ringing in your ears. Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. But I urge you to think carefully about what has been said this morning, and I urge you to think carefully about the covenant commitments that we've been made, because we're going to be looking at them in two weeks' time. I do believe that God is speaking to us, and we must listen. Um, and this is all tied up with the outreach that we're doing and our spiritual disciplines. There's been so much that God has been saying. Will we step out in faith and follow him? Amen.